Okay, guys, Math 6610, plan comparisons, uh, more on uh, contrast. Uh, you, you, you'll probably be able to tell through the, <laughs> maybe my enthusiasm, I don't know. I, I, I like this stuff because I think this, uh, uh, you know, keeping in mind where you guys are headed. Uh, and, and if you're taking 6610, probably you're going to take maybe 6620 next. And then you're probably, uh, or at least hopefully you go through the entire program and get into the research component. And... Uh, you know, I tell you a little bit about Shawnee that uh, that it, it kind of drives me crazy, and it kind of uh, has has been very beneficial. Uh, if we're going to develop a course that's going to be taught online for you know uh, like this one in the graduate program, uh, as a result of AQIP, it has to go through the distance learning committee, and uh, compare that to if I'm going to uh, create a course to be taught at the undergraduate level. Uh, in the classroom, uh, the, the process is, is pretty simple. But if we're going to create something like this to be taught online, <clears throat> the distance learning committee is, um, <laughs> makes you uh, really uh, dot your I's and cross your T's. It gets a little frustrating sometimes, but then and again, after I've gone through this a couple of times, I actually see the benefit to it. So uh, that's one of the good things that... Uh, in, in presenting this course uh, to distance learning, it's really made me step back and think about what do I really need to accomplish and when do, uh, what, what I want to accomplish and what I need to accomplish and where do things need to be uh, entered uh, in the, in the, uh, uh, the process or in the, uh, you know, the, the list of objectives. So uh, uh, I think it's working well. But anyway, when, once you get to the research sequence, the students who are currently doing that uh, uh, sequence right now, I think they're seeing the benefit to, uh, to, to the things we did in 6610. So hopefully, you know, that, that'll work for you if you decide to stick it out and, uh, and, and complete the entire master's uh, program with us. So uh, guys, what uh, I'm going to stick with this uh, uh, writing uh, method, not using my iPad. Uh, and uh, some of you, I don't know as much as, as your class, I don't, I don't, uh, hear much as much from you guys as I do uh, other people. Uh, but some of us have said, you know, they like this better, but please write uh, larger. So I'll try to keep that, uh, keep that uh, going. So guys, kind of keeping, uh, you know, uh, where we were, uh, we're kind of assuming that uh, we uh, have a statistically significant ANOVA, which, you know, as, as we all should know by now, uh, that just says that our ANOVA is less, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, the results, our p-value is less than 0.05. So we create an F-statistic, which is the ratio of the um, uh, explained variation over the unexplained variation, and that was large enough uh, considering degrees of freedom and all that fancy smancy stuff to get a p-value of uh, that was less than 0.05. So that's kind of what we're, uh, the, the assumption that we're dealing with here, uh, based on the previous video, is that we've conducted an ANOVA uh, and, and we have statistical significance. Now guys, uh, I I'm, you know, want to always, always share with you what my, my, my goals are. The reason I'm bringing in contrast right now uh, is it seemed to fit best uh, at this place because I wanted it completely separate from ANOVA and I wanted it at this point of the of the class because I wanted uh, uh, it plays an important uh, role in what we do uh, I, I don't know in a, in, in a few videos called MANOVA which is multiple analysis of variance but nevertheless if we've got a significant ANOVA uh, that just tells us that uh, there's more support For the alternative hypothesis. So we've rejected the null uh, kind of in lieu of the alternative. So you might say we've accepted the alternative which says at least one other pair of means is different. Well what do we do now? Well typically what we've done uh, we, is we did a post hoc. And uh, we conduct a post hoc test, and uh, 
the goal, obviously, a post post hoc test is just kind of <clears throat> you, know, you just jump in the middle of things and just start conducting all these possible multiple t tests and uh, try to find where the statistical significance uh, lies. Uh, I kind of refer to this as just kind of mass confusion or mass comparisons. And really nothing wrong with them if, uh, you, you know, uh, as a result of the experimental control or the, the design of your experiment, uh, you feel that mass comparisons are appropriate, then, uh, you know, this is a, a reasonable next step. Uh, some... Uh, Possible post hoc uh, options would be Chaffe. Uh, the one I probably prefer is Tukey. Uh, there's a Holm. And there's also the one I think we've looked at um, is uh, the Bonferroni. All right. So that's uh, just kind of keeping you up to date where we are. Now, I have a data set that I want to share with you, and in fact, um, you know, I want to use this as an illustration. But what the data set does uh, is it takes scores, and I think that I've uh, called this score two. The data set actually includes score one, score two, and a grouping variable. Um, but and uh, I'm using the data set in this illustration because I'm going to start the MANOVA design. Uh, with, with with this data set too, so I'm kind of uh, there, there's a reason I want to use that. But uh, what I'm setting up for you here is the score, uh, and you know I don't know what it uh, might uh, represent, but let's say it just uh, represents a, a final quiz score. And uh, the, uh, the the way I'm uh, setting up this scenario is that we have a, you know, experimental control, so to speak, uh, uh, literally, that <laughs> we have a control group. And we're wanting to see if there's any effect of supplemental instruction design. Now, supplemental instruction was something developed uh, quite a few years ago at the University of Kansas City at Missouri. It was actually developed uh, in the medical school. There was a, um, uh, I think it was actually a quantitative methods class that all students had to take where the, uh, the, the, the failure rate was extremely high. So they started looking at uh, prerequisites and, uh, you know, are people prepared for that? And uh, ultimately they started looking at, well, what if we just added some instruction along the way? Uh, would it make a difference? And it kind of ties into the whole Vincent Tinto approach that uh, the best predictor of success is time on task. So anyway... What if I wanted to look at the supplemental instruction uh, component, but the university, you know, the administrators, and of course, you know, they've got to do their job. They need to know if uh, how much supplemental instruction uh, is actually needed. And I come up with uh, with a hypothesis that uh, I think ten hours, but possibly five hours will do just as well as ten hours. So guys, clearly classic ANOVA, uh, classic uh, uh, one-way ANOVA design, where the null hypothesis is the mean for the control. I don't know how I want to do this. Let's just do it that. I think that's clear. Is the same as the supplemental instruction for five hours per week as the same as the uh, supplemental instruction for 10 hours a week. And of course, uh, I'm just going to say at least one pair of the means is different. Now, uh, as, as you uh, may imagine, uh, every uh, study has expectations. And in this uh, design, and actually I, I kind of like this design because I actually carried out something like this uh, uh, quite a few years ago at, uh, at Shawnee and actually did show supplemental instruction was, uh, was beneficial. And uh, it, it's hence the reason I think that we, we have that uh, option today at Shawnee, or at least I'd, I'd like to think I had something to do with that. Uh, but but there, there, there are multiple things here I would like to look at. Uh, the first thing I would uh, like to look at is, is my expectation that the quiz scores 
for anyone who takes any level of supplemental instruction, and it's kind of the mean quiz score, obviously, will be me, uh, higher than the mean score for the students who are in the control group. They're just going through the class in a traditional manner. These students in SI5 are getting five extra hours per week of supplemental instruction from the instructor leader. Of course, these are getting 10. Another thing that I may want to look at is I may want to dive into this supplemental instruction component, and I want to make a... Uh, uh, a case to the administration that the uh, 10 hours is better than the 5 hours. So what I've done here um, is I've done exactly what I'm trying to get you guys to see. I've kind of set out some pre-planned comparisons. Pre-planned comparisons, first of all, what I think I'll find, I think supplemental instruction is a program the Shawnee State University needs to fund because I think it improves uh, 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 academic performance. And I think that the 10 hours is better than the 5 hours, so I'd like to sell that to uh, the administration. Well, guys, again, this is a classic case of a pre-planned uh, 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 comparison. Now, uh, there are uh, some rules we're going to talk about, and uh, you know, one of the first rules I want to tell you is that, uh, uh, you, you know, how the post hoc uh, uh, differs from these planned uh, comparisons, these contrasts, okay? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, there are hypotheses for each contrast where, uh, you know, for, uh, for post-hoc, it's an all-in. Jump in, swim around, see what we can find. Just can, any possible p-value that we can actually uh, 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 calculate. Uh, let's calculate it. Uh, it's, uh, I guess the second thing I'd want to tell you uh, must be uh, derived before the data collection. Kind of <laughs> falls into the whole pre-planned uh, thing. Uh, and it's fairly standard uh, to conduct uh, two planned comparisons uh, when uh, we have treatment levels like uh, what I've demonstrated. And again, um, the uh, the you know the two plan uh, would be the uh, control versus the experimental, uh, traditional versus supplemental instruction, and then you want a uh, second contrast would dive into the uh, differences in the uh, the uh, the levels of experimental. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to run an ANOVA and uh, just 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 show you what happens here. So. Uh, let's run an ANOVA using R. And I already tell you, I've manipulated the data. <laughs> not, not, not too much, but I just manipulated the data to where we are going to get uh, uh, statistical significance. So, guys, it's been a while. We've been doing fancy smancy stuff like repeated measures and things like that. Uh, so I think it's really cool, uh, actually, to be able to kind of step back and, and, and think about things. So... Uh, what you'll have on Blackboard, you're going to see uh, a um, data set that I've uploaded called Contrast. And I've already uh, uploaded it in CSV file. So uh, 
what you may want to do is you may want to uh, uh, to pause the video and get that uh, uh, get it into R, get your computer, uh, or I should say get R up and running and uh, get contrast open and loaded. Now you'll notice that what we've got here is we've got score one and score two. Uh, I'm going to focus on score two. Uh, MANOVA, which is uh, something that's uh, just around the corner, is multiple analysis of variance. So when we have two dependent variables across a grouping variable, then a MANOVA, uh, if, if the scores are score one, score two are actually highly correlated, then a MANOVA uh, is the procedure that we need to, to conduct. So, uh, you know, think of this data set as, uh, as something we're going to, that's going to be around a while because it's going to be part of the first illustration of MANOVA. So gang, anyway, you can see what happens. Uh, score number two, which is the one we're going to focus on, uh, was uh, um, uh, uh, collected over the control group. Those are the people with no supplemental instruction. Experimental one would be, um, or EXP one, would be the um, people who, the students who had supplemental instruction with five hours, and of course EXP, EXP two supplemental instruction with 10 hours. So I have the plan contrast, and I want to, demonstrate this over um, this video. Maybe, I'm not even sure. I don't know whether I'm going to get through everything in, in this video. There may be, uh, this may be a long video or I may divide it uh, up into two parts. So uh, running ANOVA and, you know, guys, we should be uh, really good at this because um, so I'm going to run score two over my group. And, uh, you know, we should uh, know by now that uh, if we do summary of the model, uh, that we're going to get our uh, ANOVA table. Now, some things I want you to notice there uh, is the total sum of squares. It is 88.8 .8, uh, plus 323. So guys, our total sum of squares is 412. Uh, our group or model sum of squares is 88.8. .8. And our error sum of squares, sometimes referred to as residuals, because again, there's, there's, there's this connection between ANOVA and, and, and regression, uh, is uh, uh, 323.2. So I'm going to call this my explained variation, and this is my unexplained variation. Okay? Now, get back out of this and, uh, and go to, to the results. And what we can see here is we can see that the total sum of squares was 412. I think that's right. Uh, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure it was. And that this can be partitioned out into... The explained variation which I'm pretty sure was 88.8 .8. and uh, the unexplained variation And that was 323.2. I remember that because it was 3232. And hopefully that adds up to, uh, to 412. Now, when we get into uh, this new thing called planned comparisons, planned comparisons will do uh, the following for us. Uh, they will break down the variation... further uh, that's due to the experiment into components. So 
So gang, let's see, uh, let's see how this is actually uh, going to work. And uh, you guys are clever. Let me get this where I want it. So guys, at the end of the day, we have our sum of squares for our model. Which is 412. And we're going to break that down first into... Uh, the uh, variance, don't know really how I want to put this, uh, explained by the, uh, uh, the group plus the variance Explained by the control. So the variance explained by the, uh, ex let's put experimental group. Hopefully I saw so small that you guys can't, uh, can't read it, okay? So really I want to see over here the variance explained by the SI session. And the variance over here uh, explained by no SI session. What I'd like to do further than that is I'd like to take this, the SI session, and I would like to break it, break it down into uh, two more components. So the variance explained by five hours. And the variance explained by 10 hours. <clears throat> now, guys, this sets up perfectly for what I want to accomplish. This uh, examination right here. Sets up perfectly for contrast number one. And this sets up perfectly for contrast number two. So uh, contrast, uh, as I'm presenting them here, uh, let me make sure that's <laughs> it looks like look like my the, the focus got kind of off uh, there. Uh, you know, are fairly straightforward, but you know they're they're a little more work, uh, maybe a lot more work when we get into the non-orthogonal case uh, than post hocs. But uh, guys, I want you to. Uh, to, to keep some things in mind as going through these, uh, these, uh, these contrasts. Which again, just, uh, just uh, plan comparison. Number one, always uh, compare the control group To the experimental group. All right, and we did that uh, non SI versus uh, SI. Second thing, each contrast uh, must compare. only two chunks of variation. Third thing I want you to see uh, or be aware of, uh, once uh, a group uh, has been used in a contrast, and so we want to say here once the total group
Well, that's not really true either. Let me let me get rid of that total. I, I think I want to keep it like this. Uh, once the uh, group has been used, uh, 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 let's see how I want to say this. So once the group has been used in a contrast, we don't use it again. And I, what I'll get into here is I'll get into the kind of the pie slicing comparison. Uh, so if we go back to, to look at uh, the first contrast where we uh, explained uh, or, or looked at the variation uh, by the uh, supplemental instruction versus not, there, uh, the variation in the control, there was no further way to break that down into chunks. So that was just kind of a total chunk of variation with no natural way, the way that we've collected our data, uh, to break that down. So that chunk of variation right there uh, won't be uh, uh, used uh, in another contrast. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, what this means is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, in contrast number one, the placebo, uh, uh, that, which is kind of a, a general term for the, uh, for the, for the control group, uh, has no natural division for, for, for uh, you know, future contrast, where when we looked at the supplemental instruction chunk of variation, uh, we could actually uh, uh, divide that into supplemental instruction for five hours versus 10 hours. And uh, so really, uh, you know, I just said, <laughs> just said this. So I'm not going to write, uh, I'm not going to write this down. Okay. Now, uh, I really like, uh, you know, I use multiple uh, references to teach my class. Most of what I, uh, uh, I use is uh, Tavishnik and Fidel, or Fiddle, again, don't know. But uh, there's, there's uh, by Andy Field, who's uh, <laughs> actually one of the coolest statistics professors you'll ever find. Uh, you should get on YouTube and look up some of his stuff. Uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he, you know, he's, he's, he's interesting. He, uh, he tells you before you watch any of his videos, uh, that you're probably going to be offended. He will use foul language and he will, uh, use, uh, interesting examples, but he's got this English accent that just makes you kind of want to sit there and listen to him forever. But, uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> you're stuck with Doug Darbro with the Kentucky accent, so, so I'm sorry. But anyway, Andy Field comes up with what, um, uh, you know, I'm going to refer to in this situation as the cake analogy for, uh, uh, for, for choosing contrast. So guys, if you will, uh, it's not beyond the imagination to take, uh, a piece of, or our, our total cake and to take a, think of that as the total sum of squares. Now we can make these cuts and let's say we cut our cake kind of weirdly. And this is the sum of squares for the error. And I'm going to make it bigger because, uh, you know, in our case, uh, the sum of squares for model is 88.8 .8 and uh, the other was 323.2. So I'm going to make it bigger uh, to kind of let that happen. Now, if we come in here and take this piece of cake and cut it into additional pieces, well, we can divide this piece of cake in, into smaller pieces. But once we've actually made a cut, then unless we can come up with what I call a cake welder, uh, we can't put that back. Uh, so again, once we make that cut, which we did in terms of the five hours and the 10 hours in the experimental design, then uh, we can't, uh, can't put that back. So uh, the next thing we would do once there's that natural division is to start looking at how it can be used in another contrast. There's no division of the sum of squares error. Uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, up here uh, would be the uh, 510 and the, uh, the control, which would be the sum of squares for the model. So uh, kind of a, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe a way that uh, it'll make sense to you. But uh, so guys, anyway, you can't uh, take a, a piece of pie and weld it back to make it uh, usable again. And you can't take a piece of pie and take it over here and uh, do anything with it either. So uh, guys, uh, once you take your piece of cake, cut it into two slices. Uh, it can't be undone. 
Once you take a contrast, cut it into two slices, uh, it can't be uh, undone. But uh, remember, you know, you can take uh, the, the variation and divide it into smaller pieces and use those smaller pieces in future contrast. So uh, guys, uh, jumping out of the cake analogy, uh, the way I would summarize this is, um, so you, you know, once you have a, uh, a piece of variance that has been sliced from a larger piece of variance, uh, it can't be put back where it came from, and it can't be added to another piece of variance. And uh, I think in the illustration that I, uh, I, I think this is the way I'm going to end up doing it with uh, in this video, I think it'll be kind of clear uh, what that means. So it, anyway, it can just be, sub the, the variation can uh, only be subdivided uh, into smaller chunks, all right? Now, uh, let's talk about independence of uh, contrast. So there's a rule, another rule. <laughs> These contrasts are full of rules. It just kind of hit me. So the independence of contrast uh, or the uh, uh, plan comparisons. And uh, what this leads us to realize uh, by, the t by the fact that we can cut into two pieces of um, uh, the pie, if you will, with the, uh, the pie analogy is that we're always going to have uh, uh, two pieces of variance. And at the end of the day, what this kind of tells us uh, is we will always have where k is equal to the number of groups, we will always ha <clears throat> have uh, k minus 1 contrast. Okay, and that, that should be pretty clear. And we, did, and we had that in our case. Uh, here we have uh, k equal 3 groups, and we end up with uh, contrast number 1 and contrast uh, number 2. And that, uh, that will always be the case. Um, second thing uh, I want you to, uh, so I should say this is uh, of, the, of this new set of rules. <laughs> this is rule uh, number one. So of uh, this new set of rules, uh, rule number two, uh, each con contrast, some of this I've already said before, but, uh, you know, when stuff is super important, it's worth uh, uh, repeating and it's worth uh, getting on paper. Okay, so each contrast compares... Uh, 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 only two chunks of variance. Uh, and again, the way we've done it is uh, first chunk of variance was uh, supplemental instruction versus the chunk of variance for the control. And then our second contrast is five hours versus ten hours. Uh, rule number three uh, in education research, in uh, a, a lot of ed research, you'll likely have a control group. And if you think about it, if you're coming up with something in education research that is looking at a, a way to improve instruction, uh, well, you can't really know where you improve instruction unless you compare it to, uh, to what you've done. So uh, there's always going to be this uh, control focus, and uh, uh, that's going to uh, play an important role in uh, 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 setting up the first contrast. Uh, the remaining contrast are obvi obviously going to uh, probably focus in on the uh, experimental part. Uh, so uh, guys, by now you're uh, probably, or at least hopefully, 
uh, seeing the advantage to uh, a planned comparison, or you're simply not impressed. Um, <laughs> the latter, I think, is supported, supported in non-experimental uh, things where we just kind of dive in and, uh, and look around and see what we can find. But I hope you can see that in an experimental study uh, where you have uh, multiple layers possibly of the experimental treatment uh, and you want to compare these multiple layers not only with the control group but within themselves, uh, it leads us uh, into uh, the motivation for playing comparisons. So guys, uh, if you really think about it, it's just an, exper uh, an experiment with... Um, um, uh, you know, more than two levels of um, experimental control. And we had, typically have, uh, you know, certain questions, specific questions that we'd like to uh, address with our study. Now, let's, uh, let's, let's kind of break this down. And, uh, and, uh, and again, you're probably either impressed or you're still sitting there trying to figure out whether you're impressed. Or uh, you're just like, eh, I'm okay with post hoc. They work. Well, let's uh, let's uh, <laughs> not going to give up yet. Okay, so I uh, guess on the left side, I'm going to look at plan comparisons, uh, and uh, on the right side, I want to look at unplanned, which is just again the post hoc analysis. So. Uh, Advantage, a post-hoc comparison, or I'm sorry, a planned comparison lets us address the question, do specific means differ? A post-hoc ask a more general question of which means are actually different. The plan comparison compares and tests hypotheses. And the uh, post hoc compares and summarizes um, uh, the, the, uh, the relationships, if you will. Probably one of the true advantages of, of, uh, of uh, planned comparisons is your F statistic. Uh, does not need to be statistically significant. Post hocs as you uh, are well aware of by now, are only used if our F is statistically significant. And uh, these things have the power And the advantage uh, where they can be used instead of the um, omnibus uh, F statistic. Uh, and again, these are used after a significant F. Guys, omnibus, uh, that's, that's just a, a fancy smancy way of... Uh, saying that we have a, a technique that uh, looks at the proportion of variance uh, to, uh, to examine means across multiple levels. Uh, so it just tells us if some differences somewhere exist. Uh, so that's what omnibus means. Um, so, uh, you know, again, if there's more focus, more uh, research control, more things that we want to know, more specific questions that we have, uh, omnibus uh, isn't always uh. so guys um, let's um, look at some uh, examples of uh, we've seen where we have um, I don't know why but it really bugs me when this paper isn't centered 
Guys, when I'm usually stuttering around, it's because I'm trying to get that uh, because it bugs me. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's let's just look at uh, we've looked uh, uh, when 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 k is equal to three, our control uh, 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 experimental uh, si five and si ten. But uh, what if we have uh, look at a couple of examples? for uh, k equal 4 groups. So guys, at the end of the day, I'm going to stop talking, stop stop trying to impress you <laughs> that, that these things are the greatest things since sliced bread. And we're going to start looking at examples and how this actually plays out. All right. Uh, I, and, you know, quite honestly, the first time I saw planned contrast was probably, no, oh, I don't know, back in the, the late 90s or something like that when I was in grad school. And uh, when I first saw them, I, I, I was not impressed. And uh, as you... You know, if you ever do uh, ed research, uh, there are times that uh, you, you just want specific questions answered or at least uh, examined. So, guys, if we have uh, uh, four groups, uh, the first thing we know is that when we have four groups, we will have K minus one plan contrast. So we're going to end up with three contrast. Second thing we know is that um, each contrast compares two chunks of variation. Again, from the rules I gave you before. And uh, contrast number one will always compare the control with the experimental. All right, <clears throat> so guys, a possible example of this, and let's say that our four groups are control, experimental one, experimental two, and experimental three. So we have a control group, and we have three levels of uh, the, ex the experimental condition. So uh, first thing we would look at is we would look at the sum of squares for the model. including C, E1, E2, and E3. And we would divide this into two chunks of variation. The variation contributed by the control. And the overall effect of the experimental. Guys, this is going to be contrast number one. The next thing we want to do is, again, according to the goals of the study, pre-planned, right? Now, we can't use this control again. It doesn't have any subdivision. So we've used this in a plan comparison in contrast number one. This control group right here, because it has no, again, it's, it's the reason that you uh, uh, need to set these things out before you collect your data. Uh, we have no natural division of our control groups. So this is done in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, being involved in another uh, contrast. But E1, E2, E3 uh, can be separated. So maybe, much like our five uh, hours of supplemental instruction and 10 hours uh, maybe E1 and E2 are closely related, and maybe E3 is the, um, uh, you know, the, the full-on effect. I don't know. So, guys, this would be contrast number uh, two. And then, obviously, this chunk is done, just as this chunk is done. And then we could compare the 
these chunks of variation for E1 and E2. And guys, obviously this would be contrast number three. Okay. Probably goes without saying, but um, let's just um, let's let's just go ahead and. Uh, I don't really know in education if much of anything goes without saying when teaching and learning. Get this thing centered here. All right, so uh, let's say that uh, we've got another uh, four uh, model, but um, where K is four. And the, but this say this time we have. Uh, two layers of experimental and two layers of control. Well, again, contrast number one will always compare the experimental and control. Keeping in mind, guys, we have k equal four predict or predictor sheet. We have k equal four uh, uh, layers of our uh, independent variable. So contrast one, all right. Next thing we could do is compare the um, layers of the experimental condition. And the next thing we could do Is compare the, uh, uh, the 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 levels of the control group. All right, let me see how I'm running on time here. Uh, yeah, this one's got a little lengthy, hadn't it? So, uh, guys, keep in mind uh, that uh, what I presented uh, are what we call orthogonal planned comparisons. Didn't really plan on writing that down, but uh, let me let me write it down so so you've got it. Uh, there are such things as non-orthogonal. I don't really think I have uh, time to um, uh, to to go into that, but uh, a, a non-orthogonal uh, ignores uh, rule number one. You go back to the uh, the uh, cake analogy uh, or not orthogonal planned comparisons. Actually, uh, <laughs> assume that you've got a cake welder and you can actually pull out some variation, and then you can stick it back into another piece of variation. So, for example, uh, a non orthogonal may allow us to uh, to come in and look at the control versus the um, um, you know, the SI of, of 10 hours, okay? Where uh, uh, orthogonal uh, planned comparisons don't do that. Well, guys, I'll tell you what, I'm going to end this video now. Uh, I can tell that my computer is getting a little sluggish. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed or not, but QuickTime, at least I should knock on wood here, uh, didn't crash on me. I've been using a different computer uh, because um, I found out that uh, uninstalling and reinstalling QuickTime on Macs is not as simple as, as it may sound. So, uh, guys, that's it. Have a good one.